Okay. All right, everyone. So we should be on the air. Can people just say in the chat if they can hear us or not? Uh, at the beginning, I'll just say that uh, I'm Sam Shankland, and this is Dan and uh, We're grandmasters from California, and we both do some series for iTrust. And our series, The Shankland Method and The Naroditsky Method, fail together for a price of $79. When normally they're individually $120. Now you're getting $79 for the two of them. That's a great deal. I'm just going to type in the, uh, the link to the sale here. Let's see if anybody can... Uh, Occasion would be very nice because so far we see no one in the chat responding to us. We're talking into the ether. <laughs> you can see Freddie in the background there. <laughs> Dressed for the occasion as always. 67 viewers and nobody wants to talk to us. Can people not hear us? Like, I'm pretty. We can okay, hear. You. We can hear you. <clears throat> Excellent. All right. So, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Sam Banklins. I'm a grandmaster from California, officially rated 2671 FIDE. Uh, so I know a couple things about chess. And uh, uh, I'm Grandmaster Daniel Nerdisky from the Bay Area, officially rated 2647. Um, that's going to drop after my latest tournament, but I still know a thing or two about chess as well. Um, and hopefully, you can learn from us. So today we're going to be talking a bit about the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz, and in particular with respect to uh, Gary Kasparov's comeback. So um, started without further ado, and uh, a lot of interesting games. So what was your favorite Kasparov game in this tournament? Uh, actually, I um, one of his last games against Dominguez uh, in the Blitz, I think, was very very nice positional game. Um, he just completely outplayed him. Uh, I was. You know, kind of naively hoping that Kasparov would come and everyone would see, you know, fire and brimstone and everything would just explode and he would beat everybody. Now, that's kind of a naive view given that he hasn't played for this long, but I thought he had some pretty decent efforts. He also beat Nakamura, which was pretty impressive. Yeah, I was optimistic about Kasparov as well, but in particular, given that he played in this splits tournament at the end of the U.S. Championship, I think, last year or 2015? Yeah, yeah, one of, one 2015, I think, yeah. And uh, he, his result was very respectable. He finished on plus score when playing with uh, So Nakamura and Caruana, who are pretty good at chess. So we're going to take a look at some of the games. Um, Daniel was mentioning later because that was right at the end of the yeah, tournament. Yeah. So for now, let's start with, um, I guess we'll choose, uh, I think really the one that stood out to me from the first day was uh, the Aronian. Oh, no, was it Aronia or was it Nakamura? Yeah, no, it was with Nakamura, the first game. So let's take a look at this wow. one here. Uh, let me just make sure they can see our screen. Um, yeah. So we have to go here, screen share, and then we choose the board, I think, yeah. This, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, should now, be seeing, you should be seeing the board. We just got some confirmation if we actually see the board. Um, everyone see the board that we've got here? And no, we're not in St. Louis, Angela Collins. We're actually in North Korea. <laughs> yeah, we're there. Are, there are North Korean agents at our door. Okay. Yeah, so, so uh, can everyone see the board? Uh, yes, looks okay, like. Okay, great. Great. All right, so uh, here we saw Kasparov, the Grunfeld, which wasn't really the opening that he was most known for. I think he was mainly a King's Indian. King's Indian, yeah. He played a little bit of everything, but the Grunfeld, I think, was his B opening. And so. And I guess maybe he was a little worried about the Kings Indian nowadays, but I think he put the Kings Indian actually in the St. Louis tournament previously. Uh, yeah, that sounds games. that sounds about right. I mean, he claimed that he prepared a little bit um, for this tournament. Um, yeah. My guess is that partly he was just winging it and saying, "All right." Sure. Well, he yeah. seemed to come reasonably well cooked up. So um, it went Bishop G five, Bishop G seven. Nor I have always preferred the move knight e4 here. I never really cared for bishop g7 for black, but it's not such a bad move. So bishop f6, bishop f6, cd. And nowadays, I think the main move is c5. If yeah, c5 is better than me. C5 is kind of the hot line. Um, I seem to think that black should be able to equalize in this line um, with the best play. The, the line is dc. Um, well, I can actually take dc in two different ways, but I think taking on Passan is pretty innocuous, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Uh, so after DC, I think the move is castles, I think, first. Yes. Um, I'm kind of hazy. Knight of three, knight d7. I think it's queen d2 here. Yeah, there's several moves. There's just e3. I'm but pretty there's... sure queen d2 is right, because you want to make queen f5 with rook b1. Okay. Yeah, uh, that sounds 
That sounds uh, right. Yeah, in this position, after something like Knight takes c5, black has obvious compensation for the pawn, but whether it's enough for full equality is at least somewhat up for debate. I wasn't yeah. always fully convinced. But uh, going back to the way the game went, Kasparov went with a uh, a somewhat um, a somewhat older right move with c6, which I don't think is a bad move at all. Uh, which, as Daniel said, d takes c6, which would transpose to the previous line of c5, is pretty innocuous. Uh, so um, white plays e4 and tries to take the whole center, and now castle. And here Nakamura played knight f3, which is a move that I don't know. Um, it doesn't look very good to me, to be honest. Uh, and in fact, actually, just four moves later, white brought the knight back to g1. Um, I remember believing that e5 was white's most critical line. And after bishop g7, b5, white brings the bishop back to b3, and now after b4, c takes c5, material has been equalized, but uh, the center is now pretty stable, and there's not much room for it to be blown up any further, and white can start kingside operations with the move h4. And this position is very interesting. I mean, I think black is best advised to just let white play h5 and play like knight c6, bishop a6, and queen b6 to put counter pressure on the center. And it's quite an interesting one. I'm sure Kasparov had something in mind. But uh, Nakamura played knight f3, and this is sort of where I'd expect Kasparov to uh, to really shine, where um, his opponents are playing something maybe a little bit dubious. So yeah, I mean, white, you know, black has a two bishop advantage. The way Nakamura played it, you know, was he went for just positional crunch in the center, but given the fact that you know black has the two bishops and possibilities of breaking up the center with f6, I think this is just Nakamura being Nakamura, you know, just trying to get a position. Um, right. And now things get pretty interesting. So after c takes d5, e5, bishop g7, uh, queen d2, here I think we're just sort of seeing that knight on f3 is simply misplaced. It will get hit by bishop g4, and then white doesn't really want to trade that knight off with bishop e2 because he'll be left with a weak pawn on d4. So for instance, the game continued, knight c6, and now white played bishop b5. But if he were to play bishop e2, um, yeah, I guess bishop g4 is possible. And then a fate like h3 is quite cooperative. Bishop f3, bishop f3, and e6. Yes, and here black is ready for something like f6 next. And I think already white has got to think pretty hard about equalizing. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of pressure on his position. So Hikaru made sort of a natural decision with bishop b5 to pressure this knight who's further pressuring the center. And if white can take on c6 and prevent black from playing c5, he should have a very good position. But unfortunately, I just don't think he's in time for that because Kasparov just plays very energetically with bishop g4. And here we're seeing that um, Nakamura just sort of agrees with me that his knight is misplaced and voluntarily dropped it all the way back to g1. Yeah, and bishop, allowing bishop takes f3 and crippling the pawn structure would be completely suicidal because in addition to that d4 pawn, white would be saddled with a horrible pawn structure. So. Right. You know, now, I'm curious if after bishop takes c6, Kasparov intended to take on f3 in between. Uh, there's sort of a series of consecutive captures. So if white plays g takes f3 after b takes c6, black is extremely comfortable. He'll play e6 and then f6 to break open the center and open the f file. Um, but bishop takes b7 is much more challenging, and now something like bishop takes g2. And I think black should be better here after something like rook g1, rook b8. Yeah, rook g1, rook b8, and if bishop a, bishop h1 obviously is... Also right. pretty good. Uh, although this, I don't think it's strictly necessary either, because in the event of b takes c6, uh, white really does not want to allow c5, but a move like knight a4 is going to allow bishop takes f3. Mm. And if he tries to defend against bishop takes f3 with, I don't know, maybe queen e3 or queen f4, yeah, I'm I going to take anyway. And queen b6. Yeah. Yes, well, queen b6, castle long. I, oh, you can castle long. That's but true. Even still, even that's, still that's yeah. Probably very good but you black. can just prepare c5 straight away. You can also play c5 right play now C5 if you away. feel like it. I think that black has just a very good counterplay in the center. So instead of all this, Hikaru played knight to g1. And um, Well, here, I'd like to actually pause this and see if we can give some of our viewers a chance to find uh, what black should play here. Let's see. Someone has suggested h3 first, presumably to disallow bishop g4. That's a thought, but I think that black will very quickly break with f6 there. Um, does anybody here have a suggestion as to what uh, black should play? Still waiting on a suggestion? Yeah, so f6 has been recommended, and I believe this is the best move. 
Strategically, I'm not sure I love it, but because White is just so far behind in development, it makes sense to try to open the center directly. And very quickly, Kasparov just got a good position. After E takes F6, or H3, H3 first. H3 first, but, you know, it's not. Soon enough, E takes F6, Rook takes F6, came. Bishop C6, BC, Knight G2. This was I mean, a square the Knight should have been on the whole time, but... Yeah, it took him some tempi, but I think it's also good to notice that while the e5 square might strike someone as weak, it's really completely beside the point here because even if I plan to knight on e5, which you won't do, but you know, this square is no meaning, but I can just undermine it with c5. So that's not a consideration that should deter one from playing f6. Right. So I very much like the way Kasparov proceeded here. Um, when I was watching this, my first instinct was to aim for the c5 break, but actually Kasparov wanted to play for e5 instead, which I like even more. And. Um, I, I like that, uh, you know, my first instinct might be something like bishop f7 to try to get e5 through, but Kasparov started with queen d6, which I think was very clever. After castle, he brought his rook to this nice active f8 square, and his point is now that rook is gone, his bishop on e6 is actually not a very good piece, and he can reroute it to a6, where it puts a lot of pressure on white's position, and then e5 will come next. And so after rook a to e1, bishop c8, Hikaru played knight a4, and he could try f4 to... Uh, stop e5, but then he will run into bishop a6 or c5, or even sometimes g5, or bishop h6. Bishop a6, bishop a6 would be a nice setup. Yeah. In fact, actually, after f4, bishop h6, I believe white is losing a pawn on the spot. I think that probably shuts the door on f4. Yeah. So in, under these circumstances, after knight a4, black gets e5 in. And we'll just stop here. And I just say, this is sort of the story of Kasparov's tournament. He, I think he quite convincingly has outplayed Nakamura up to this point. He has a bishop pair, a decent pawn center. He's not winning by any stretch, but he, I think black is clearly better. Yeah. And somehow things just didn't really add up. He, he didn't win this game, and I think at the end he was the one playing for a draw. And that's sort of... I don't know how to describe it. Well, it's say? kind of the... I think Rust is also plays a role here because, you know, there's his class remains and his ability, his intuitive ability to just find the right plan. But at some point you need to kind of hunker down and be very, very precise against, especially against these guys, because, you know, you can't choose between four different types of plans. At some point, in order to convert your advantage, you need to find the plan. And sometimes Kasparov, number one, took a lot of time and got into time pressure. Um, but most of all, he just didn't have that crispness that in his younger years would have allowed him to find that to zero in on that precise plan of converting some advantage. Yeah, and especially in a game like this, I mean, I can speak from personal experience with Hikaru. I've had Hikaru in bad shape several times, but I've only ever drawn those games. He's a very resourceful Not defender, yet. and you have to um, you have to really be fully focused and uh, very crisp, as Daniel says, to put him out of his misery. And uh, Kasparov, I think that was just a little bit missing in his games. I mean, here, I mean, we can just sort of go through how the game proceeded. Seems like reasonable enough moves, but somehow, like, I don't know if I love queen b2. Um, yeah, it seems like he's bailing out, giving the knights a lot of life in, the, in that end game. Yeah, and now it also frees the uh, the knight on e2, for example. If black were to play something like queen f6 instead, um, and he's ready for bishop b5 next, this knight on e2 is going to have a very bad time. Yeah. And I think black is pleasantly better here. Um, so... I don't know. I mean, it's going to be hard to point out to any specific move. He did not blunder in this game, at least not really that I saw. But uh, somehow, like, he, he didn't really find the right way forward. And, you know, soon enough after queen b2, first white solved the problem of this knight. And now the dark squares are a little bit weak and the pawn on c6. Yeah, is... the bishop is also kind of somewhere off sides yeah. on b2. So And so after something like this, I mean, it's still totally fine for black, but it just it wasn't quite as strong as it could have been. So, you know, and I, I was really a little disappointed by this because growing up, Gary Kasparov was my hero. I mean, my half of the shanklin Naroditsky method was all, is all about this um, using tactical means to uh, achieve positional goals. And Gary was very, very good at that. And somehow things were just not quite... Yeah, I mean, it wasn't quite there. And I think people are somewhat hoping for that. I, I was really devastated when he retired, for example. I was also, I watched all of his super tournaments from the early 2000s. I'd sometimes get up in the morning. I Now I value sleep, but I used to really watch his games. And yeah, there was some, some sort of, you know, brilliance, just this energy that shined in his younger years. And I think it's to be expected that in some ways he just wasn't able to maintain that same, um, you know, spark. 
Yeah, and this may be part age, part rust. You never know. But uh, in any case, I don't think there's too much more to say about this game. In fact, actually, one of our viewers is asking about the game with Navarro, which is one I was going to. No, no, oh, yeah, so was, next. So Kasparov started with three draws, and then he lost sort of a back and forth game to Napolnishi. I don't even think he played that badly. It was just a complicated position, and he made the last mistake. But let's um, let's take a look at the game he played with Navarro. Uh, just a moment. Um, it's probably further down. Yes, it was. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just make sure you guys can see this. Um, close them. This one should be gone, right? Yeah, I think it's lagging. Okay, so could you guys not see us during that screen share? I don't know. We're kind of novice about this stuff, but uh, let's go grab um, this. Yeah, I started sharing it again, okay, just in case. Yeah, okay, and so there we'll go. share this, make it smaller so that hopefully people can see us as well. Um, so now, let's see, hopefully you guys should be able to see the board now. Um, in any case, so this game, okay, you only saw the board while we were talking. That's fine. Uh, well, now you can see our faces. Yeah, now we should see the board again. <laughs> okay, well, we'll go back and we'll forth. Go back Hopefully and forth, Daniel's yeah. ugly face doesn't ruin <laughs> you guys too much. But uh, So the next one we're looking at is um, Kasparov Navarra. Uh, so here, I really liked the beginning of this game because it really showed the kind of spirit that Kasparov played with back in the day. So Karo Khan and... I think really everybody and their grandmother at the top level believes that the short variation is the best way to play for an advantage, which continues here with knight f3, e6, and bishop e2. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that, well, I, I think that black is okay, but there's a lot of lines. And, it's uh, very complex. There's possibilities and, here. Well, I believe black is okay. I also think it's the best chance for white to fight for mm -hmm. an edge. Um, but instead, Kaspar went with knight c3, which is a very aggressive move. Um, and it's one I never had the highest opinion of, but if he can revive it, more power to him. So e6, g4, bishop g6, knight g2, c5. And I believe Alexander Fier played h4 against me here. I could be wrong about the exact move order, but I had this game here where we went h4, h5, because I didn't want to allow white to play h5. And after knight f4, I gave up this pawn on h5 for quick compensation after c takes d4, trying to break down the center. I believe the game continued, knight b5, knight c6, knight takes d4, knight takes c5 here. And this was quite an interesting game. Um, I forget if, no, maybe it was bishop b5 check first. Maybe it was c3, I'm not sure I remember. Something like this, bishop b5 check here. And here I think Alex played um, bishop g5 or something like that, which is a mistake. What he needed to do is play this sort of funny move, bishop h6. Um, Point being that gh6 fails to mate, and only once black has played rook g8, he probably saw rook g8 and realized there's nothing, but in fact, actually, now the bishop simply drops back to g5 and the rook is significantly mm -hmm. worse on g8. In any case, also, we should probably enlarge the board a little. It seems that. Oh, yeah, it's too small. Make it full. Okay. Full yeah, screen we can... Okay, so, but that's a little bit neither here nor there because that was sort of my impression of the line, but Kasparov came up with a different idea, which was bishop e3 here. Mm hmm. Now, I don't remember analyzing this move. It's possible I checked it briefly, but I, I don't know this off the top yeah, of Yeah, I don't know anything about this line, really. I don't play with either color, but you know, I'm sure he didn't you know, just pull it out randomly during the game. Yeah. He definitely took a look. But I mean, Navarra's move makes a lot of sense. He played knight e7. Yeah. So this allows white to take on c5, but his point is now, uh, after h5, uh, the, the white structure is going to be severely compromised, and in particular, his king side is really asking for trouble. And so, for example, I think g5 is extremely complacent, but after knight f5 here, this bishop on e3 is hanging. If it moves, it has to give up the defense of either g5 or c5, and then like knight c6 is coming, and this is a strategic disaster for white. So, um, And he can't go knight f4 because the g6 bishop is protected by the knight that Navarro just put on e7, so. Yeah, so this is, um, I think here, black would just have a good position. He really is getting control of the f5 square. And I don't know if this was preparation or not, but Kasparov came up with this move f4, which I really like. Uh, I don't believe it's a showing an advantage. In fact, black might even be slightly better, but for a rapid game, it's still quite a decent practical try. Um, so uh, 
Here, of course, uh, Black plays h5, continue with his plan. Yeah, and he has to undermine the pawn. Here, Kasparov revealed his point, is that he doesn't want to give Black access to the f5 square with his pieces and leave himself with a bad structure. So let's see if any of the viewers here can uh, figure out how Black should uh, proceed in this position. How white. So, excuse me, how white should proceed here. So, so I have to do like this so I can see the chat. Hopefully that's okay. So let's see if anyone can figure out what white should play in this position. I don't know what language that is, but no, I don't it looks like Polish. <laughs> Polish? Yeah, no, I don't get to see. Okay, so someone has suggested F5. Now, I don't know if you're suggesting that on your own accord or if you've just read the text of what happens next, <laughs> but uh, I like it. So F5, yeah. and the point is now, after E6, F5, G5, why is simply accepting that he's a pawn down, but pointing out a few things. Uh, this knight who really wants to go to the f5 square now has nowhere to go. This bishop is really bad on g6. Oh, really? What makes you think that? It has so many squares. Yeah, that bishop is <laughs> just a total nightmare. And in particular, if white manages to stick a knight on f5, yeah. which he will, uh, there's a lot of pressure on black's position. And in addition, it's not wildly relevant right away, but at some point the e6 thrust could become relevant to open up the black king side. Yeah, I mean, and if black tries f4 here, I don't think that would be the end of the world. I mean, it's a common thing when you sack a pawn in order to close up the pieces to re-sacrifice it, but f4, knight takes f4 looks just like way too much activity for the pieces, so yeah. Black is stuck with all these So someone pieces. Asked, just now asked a very interesting question, one that I actually was curious about myself when I was watching the game. It shouldn't Black immediately go f4 to free the bishop? Uh, the problem here is that after knight takes f4, we see a sort of similar position to the game, and now while Black's bishop is a bit more free, Black is a tempo down in the yeah. game at one knight bc6, knight takes f4. And the problem is here, while Black has the strategic problem of the bishop on g6, he also has a concrete problem that bishop g2, knight takes d5, queen e2, castle long is coming, when all of white's pieces yeah. are ready to blast through in the center, where Black is sort of unable to castle. So, well, strategically, I think f4 is a sound move. Against Kasparov, I think you'll find yourself checkmated pretty quickly here. Um, so, it's I think Black sort of has to accept that his... Um, his position, his bishop is going to be buried for at least a little while. So the game won knight b6, which I do believe is best. Knight f4, and here Navarra played a6, and to my mind, such a move is too slow. Um, yeah, I mean, he's trying to probably stop knight b5, but there are bigger right. fish to fry here, it seems, um, at least intuitively. So I believe black, sh uh, black should take on d4 directly, and after bishop takes d4, play queen a5. And this prepares him to castle long. He is ready to play something like knight takes d4 followed by knight c6 next. And most importantly, it's not that easy for white to actually find a good move here. Um, he doesn't really want to move the queen and burn a tempo after knight takes d4. And uh, let's say he were to continue along like the way he did in the game with bishop g2. After castle long, I think black is just doing absolutely fine here. I don't see Yeah, he probably wants to take at this point and play knight c6 already and d4 yeah. starts hanging in the air. Yes, and I think here black is doing quite fine. So, But this is quite tough to find as well in a rapid game. So Navarra played a6, and here Kasparov started to take over. So bishop g2, and now the pawn on g5 is is just a point of conquest. The pawn will simply be lost. Um, and in, in particular, I don't really love the move a6 when considering the white bishop just went to g2 anyway. I mean, the only real point of a6, I think, would be to keep pieces off of b5. So... Um, here we're going to go uh, c takes d4 from Navarra, bishop d4, queen d4, knight d4, queen d4, knight c6. And so here we're seeing that black is still upon up, and now he's not even that far behind on development. Uh, the queen is hit, g5 is hanging. So uh, I'm going to um, make this a little bit tougher so that you don't get to see the move played here. <laughs> but uh, hopefully um, we will uh, see if anyone can find white's best move, and just as a hint as to find the best move, I think you should move the queen. Yeah, what a what an astute hint, because I was really considering long castle, yes. supporting that d4 square. Right, so let's see. Can we not talk about birds and microwaves? It was a chest-based noise, and people think it was an oh, exploding okay. bird. Yes, it was a chest-based noise because I clicked on an illegal square on accident because I have clumsy hands or something. <laughs> In any case... Uh, White has to move his queen here. I'd like everyone to see if they can figure out what the best square is.
Still waiting on an answer. Well, yeah, that's great if you saw the <laughs> game, but let's see if you can figure it on your own. While we're waiting for answers, I'd just like to remind everyone that we're here to promote the Shanklin Naroditsky method. And if you buy it, you will have our uh, full gratitude. That is 15 hours of my course of uh, yes, yeah. and 15 hours of so Daniel's course. 30 total. So 30 hours of high quality training with the best Californians that California has to offer. And, uh, you know, I'll just give the link here once again for anyone who wants to buy it. It's $79. It's normally 120 each. So 79 for the two is an incredible deal. Yeah. It's less, I mean, I don't mean to be sales, but it's less than the price of a lesson in modern times, and you get 30 hours of content. Yeah, so it's, it's a good deal, so you should buy it. Um, so yeah, Queen we get D5 a lot of Queen D5. Queen yeah. D5 has been suggested a lot, but I don't really love this move because I think Black's biggest problem is uh, king safety. So there's two reasons. One, I think that after Queen takes G5, there's a lot of counterplay here, specifically because this knight is hanging. And when white wants to develop, you know, with threats sort of like here, the problem is now the queen on d5 is misplaced. And black can quickly, quickly play rook d8, and then he will get bishop c5 check in. And I think that he's sort of going to get castled and probably be okay. Yeah, I mean, once he castles the king's safe, you know, there's no reason why black should be in badly. So. And another reason is I don't really love allowing the queens to be just traded on the spot after something like, I don't know, bishop takes d5 and maybe castle long here. I don't yeah, know. I mean, black might be, you know, nominally worse because of the bishop, but still, I mean, you got to... Right. You know, still, I mean, White's really sold it's himself to, short here. You know? It's hard to punish Black here. For example, e6 would be the direct move, but I think after bishop d6. Yeah, too much development now for Black. Black has it under control, and now he's probably much better. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, it's better for White to keep the queens on the board, and the best way to do that is queen f2, as someone copied from the man himself <laughs> instead of finding on their own. Tisk tisk tisk. But I think that queen f2 is a very nice square for the queen for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's just it's not really vulnerable. It's not getting hit by stuff. <coughs> Secondly, it prevents bishop c5. And thirdly, and in some cases, it might come to like g3. Uh, for instance, I was thinking um, if uh, queen a5. Yeah, uh, another bird. bird noise. <laughs> queen a5, if castle long, if something like bishop c5, the queen might be sitting quite nicely yeah. on g3. Um, but. Uh, here, Navarro played bishop b4, which is a very natural move. He wants to get himself uh, castled, and he wants to start trading off pieces. But it wasn't really enough to save him. So white castled long. Black took this opportunity to butcher the structure, takes, takes, and he played queen. Yeah, but now he's left to that bishop. <laughs> and now uh, here I really like the way Kasparov proceeded, using transitions correctly. Let's see. So someone says the Naroditsky method is very interesting. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. So I have a suggestion for you, Marcin Detiuk. Why don't you buy the Naroditsky Shankland Method bundle? It's cheaper than the Shankland Method on its own, and give the Naroditsky Method, which you liked, to a friend, and then uh, <laughs> keep that bundle. You can even sell that Naroditsky Method to a friend once the sale is over and make a profit. So anyhow, here we go. We're up to this point. At the, here, white clearly has attacking chances, but black is also ready to whisk his king away to either side, and white's king is not wildly perfect either. So like everyone in positive videos and see if they can, not positive videos, but you know, take a moment to see here uh, if you can find a good way for Kasparov to proceed. Let's see if we can find some guesses from the peanut gallery. Okay. So knight takes d5 has been suggested. That's a decent move, but I don't really like getting rid of this knight on f4. e6 is the most aggressive move in the position. It's probably pretty decent, but I... It's one of those cases where the threat might be stronger than its execution. e6, maybe black can just castle. Castle long. Yeah, so someone mm -hmm. has suggested rook takes d5. There's a lot of reasonable moves here. Rook d5, knight d5, bishop d5, e6. Uh, but the move Kasparov played is rook d5. I'm not convinced this is the best move, but I do think it's the simplest. And his point is that after queen takes c3, Kasparov is actually happy to exchange queens. Yeah, really strong positional idea. It really shows class, I think. It's not easy to see immediately why this is so good, but right. but you, when, you, when you let it sink in, um, it becomes clear that black is really just positionally busted in the end game. Right. So the first thing to notice here is black cannot avoid the queen trade. If he tries mm -hmm. queen a1 check after king d2, the white king is totally safe. 
the rook on h1 is defended. And if black tries, I don't know, queen takes a2 after rook d6, e6, you name it. Here black is going to get mated. He cannot castle either way. His king is stuck in the center. This this should be made without too much discussion. I quite like rook d6 with the point that if black tries to castle out of it, the queen will be loose on a2 at the end of all this. Um, so there's really no choice but to trade queens. And here if we think to ourselves, right now material is equal. Or no, excuse me, yeah, black is one pawn up. But after an incoming bishop takes c6, that pawn is about to be lost. And more importantly, if you think about this bishop, how will he ever get back into the game? He has nowhere to go right now. The only way to make room for him is f6, which is guarded not only by two pawns, but also the bishop is hanging on g6. Yeah. So that pawn can't move. h4 will not help anybody. So uh, black just has an extremely difficult position here. Yeah, I mean, the bishop is completely in prison, and it's... Uh, I mean, the longer you look at it, the more horrible the position looks for black. I think Navarro wasn't feeling too good here. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe he could have tried rook c8 to maintain material parity, but it didn't really... Yeah, even rook d1 there, I guess, and rook d6. Yes, rook d1 would be what I expect. Um, rook d1, maybe king e7, but it's still just bad. Rook d6, knight takes e5 is the point, but maybe white can start with bishop takes c6. Yeah, yeah. This all seems like very bad news. In addition, black has to worry about e6 at all times as well. Um, Navarre castled just to get his king as far away from the center as possible. But now, after the simple bishop c6 and rook, rook d1, you know, that pawn of 2 6 is not going anywhere. White will take it soon enough. First, he wanted to get his rook to d6. I very much like the move c4 as well, keeping all the unwanted guests off of b5. This was really showing typical Kasparov class. He got the, um, he got this bishop, uh, just not the bishop, he, he got a big lead in development. He blew yeah. up the center when black wasn't ready. He wasn't able to give mate, but he got a clear advantage in the end game, and now he's per prosecuting it extremely Yeah, he's showing class, and he's showing that energy that, that persisted in his younger years, that, like, the spark, you know, C4, very active, active prophylaxis almost. It's, yeah. it's like he's always pushing forward, so. Yeah, it's prophylaxis, mm -hmm. but also White's plan is to queen this pawn. Yeah, it's not like so. it's losing time. So, Rook D8, and now White has another very strong move here. I'd like everyone to see if they can figure out on their own. So, let's see if anyone can... Uh... Come up with a move for me. Yes, rook d6 mm -hmm. is a very automatic positional move. Um, white wants to keep black's pieces as passive as possible, and rook d6 does exactly that. Uh, he doesn't mind a rook trade, but only if he drags this pawn here. Here, white has a completely winning position because, in addition to all of black's previous problems, now white's going to have a monstrous pass pawn on d6. He's going to have two or three chases on c6, and they're going to be connected. Black can, so. black can play rook c8, but after rook a5, it's hopelessly lost. Yeah. Um, so, uh, unsurprisingly, Navarro did not go for this and instead brought his king over. But this is pretty futile. Rook takes c6, rook c8. King c2. Yeah, just bringing the king up. There's no yeah. hurry. At this point, material is equal. Black has a dead bishop on g6 that is doing just nothing, <laughs> and there's really not much for him to do. The a-pawn will soon fall, and the c-pawn will go. And you might ask, well, Kasparov won this game easily, right? <laughs> right. Not quite. Mm, yeah. So, and then you might be like, okay, he blundered and drew. That, well, not, not that either. So yeah. This was really painful for Daniel and I, because we're players of the... We were growing up in the in the years where Kasparov was dominant. And yeah. It was really a treat to watch, and it's it's hard to see him like this now, just losing this much form. But Black tried h4. Uh, I guess trying to gain some space and potentially prevent h4 from white, but I don't think it does that much because the bishop still can't snake out via h5. Let's see. Um, someone wanted to cement the, uh, the bishop with h4 from white. That's probably not such a bad idea, but I also yeah. don't really see a great reason for it. I mean, Black, as you said, is not it's exactly not like threatening that. bishop h5. Yeah, the bishop is still not going anywhere. <laughs> you know, the only potential downside would be if Black ever hunts down the h-pawn, but that's so far, and I mean, that's such an unrealistic... Well, you know, happened, given right. what happened, yeah. It might seem to be unrealistic. Right. So it was... Um... Okay, so Kasparov traded rooks and brought his king up, and he's ready to shove the c-pawn forward. I mean, not yet, but uh, pretty soon. So a5, rook a6, rook b8, rook takes a5. Now white is a pawn up. He's got two pass pawns that are just sort of running wild. Yeah, I mean, I'd, be gets his yeah. Rook with rook b1. I mean I'd be curious to know why because Barrow can just push c5 straight away, why, why rook a6 was necessary, but yeah. I guess this is fine. This um, is definitely still winning, but things yeah. are getting a little more complicated. So c5 is played, and now rook e1. 
And I wouldn't be surprised if what had happened was Kasparov had seen this position and thought he had the move c6 here and overlooked it after rook c1 checked the pawn is lost. Because here I noticed uh, Kasparov, he didn't, I mean, it was a rapid game. By definition, he did not have tons of time, but he had enough. Like, he could have, but I think he very quickly made a, a pretty hasty move with knight d3. Um, there's a lot of better moves here available. So my guess is what he overlooked was that after knight d3, Rookie three, as was played. In the game he played, uh, did this happen? Oh, no, he started with he rookie. He started a check, yeah. Uh, he had a couple of checks, pushing the king back doesn't change the nature. Played knight d3. And my guess is what happened is Kasparov missed it after rookie three, king d4, black has to move f4. My guess is this is what happened. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Because if you don't see that, and here you expect black to play like rook h3 or rook e4, check king d5, there's nothing else to calculate after c6, yeah. the game is over. So... King g4 felt very natural. My guess is this is what Kasparov had in mind. In fact, I think I saw him actually put his king on d4, but not take his hand off the piece, mm -hmm. and then quickly change his mind to king d2. Um, this is still a very difficult position for black, but uh, you know, there's it's already a game, chances. yeah. Now, Navarro played rook h3 here, which definitely loses, but after f4 takes and rook takes e5, I think there's still some saving chances. Um, it's... If I ha I'm not really a betting man, but if I was, I'd probably say this is closer to a win for White than a draw. But I think here there's still a bit more to fight for. In any case, Navarra tried Rook H3. I guess he was getting opportunistic here. He might have been sensing that Gaspar was losing the thread. And looking for direct and, counterplay. I mean, and, I mean, he was rewarded, yeah. All right, so C6, Rook takes H2 check. And this is the spot. If there was one moment all tournament that I just didn't get from Gaspar, this was it. White is winning here for sure. It's not even that tough, but I'd like everyone to just see if they can figure out how white should uh, play here. This is something you'll see a lot in my courses, by the way. I always ask people to pause their videos. Yeah, and, same here. It's because it, active learning is much better than passive learning. You can never learn to become a great chess player uh, by just being talked at. So we're seeing a couple of people saying King C3. That is right. I was watching this the whole time, and I was like, King C3, play King C3. Yeah. And, and it's like, very natural. It's not one of those moves which, I mean, you're, you're, you're blocking off the C2 square, yeah. and you're threatening Rook A8 followed by C7, just cleaning the pawn. Yeah, I have no idea what Kasparov could have missed after King C3. I just don't see any defense whatsoever. And King D8 looks forced, probably. Um, otherwise, Rook A8 check. Okay, but King D8, Knight F4 back, and then yeah. the Rook is frozen. And Knight D5 uh, is winning immediately. And, yeah, it's, it's just Black would have resigned, I mean, I think. It's just absolutely over. Yep. And, uh, I don't know what Kasparov could have missed, but he put the King on E3, which allowed Black to come back with Rook C2. Yeah, this was... At really... which point, White has clearly lost control of the game. Now this C-pawn is not that dangerous, and this H-pawn is actually playing, like, very, very soon. Yeah, so it's become a reality. <laughs> so... Uh, Maybe just to introduce more inertia to the position, Gasparov played e6. Presumably he was banking on the tactical resource that uh, rook takes c6 would fail to taking on f7. Um, oh. actually does even, does that even work? I mean, maybe maybe suddenly bishop f7, knight e5, rook e6, king f4. Yeah, maybe. Okay, white can make a draw here by giving checks. Because I mean, yeah. black king knight e5 king. still looks pretty good for white, to be honest. Yeah. Knight e5, rook e6, king f4. Then I'm going to... H3. You want to play h3. Okay, you can give a check and come around to h3. Yeah, but, but after rook a6, you're not going to win. Yeah, it's a draw. So, I don't know, but uh, I think Navarro found an even better move than this. He realized that e6, yeah, it prevents rook c6, but I don't really need rook c6, and e6 doesn't threaten anything, and I'm going to go on my merry way and play h3. And all of a sudden, this pawn is extremely dangerous. Yeah. So... Um, I mean, could Kasparver save the game? I'm pretty sure he, yeah, he, can, he can still so draw. Knight before is fine. Um, this should be okay. Uh, H2 is played. Oh, no, first no, F4 check. check. Yeah. F4 check is actually very accurate because now the white king is going to be forced somewhere inconvenient because king takes F4 would fail to rook C4 check. And now black has two pass pawns running. And this bishop who was on G6 this whole game now suddenly is like looking pretty good. So king D4, uh, H2. And now um, white has to get behind this pawn. And black certainly is absolutely fine here in more ways than one. But uh, I quite like the way that um, that uh, Navarro played it. So he gave a check on d2 before anything else, just asking this king where he wants to go. 
it's not easy to find a square, uh, for instance, if white were to play king c3, which seems most natural because it hits the rook and uh, prevents rook c2 and whatnot. Black can play rook c1. This threatens the queen. And after takes f takes c6, I think black has yeah, got those everything fast under control again. and should be doing just fine. So that would have uh, not been great. So Kasparov instead played king c5. And here, it looks very strong because white is ready for c7, uh, and it doesn't seem like black can stop it. But black has a very good maneuver here uh, that he can pull off. So I'd like everyone to pause their videos, or sorry, pause their videos, but uh, see if you can figure out what black should play in this position. There is no day six, William Harvey. Five the tournament is over, yeah. It's all over, Iranian one. Okay, bishop e4 is indeed the best move. This mm -hmm. bishop who's been dead the whole game uh, finally finds an active role. It seems to be fitting, I mean, given that Gaspar kind is of... preparing to quit <laughs> the h-pawn, and more importantly, after c7, bishop b7, uh, black is back in time to defend. Now, after king b6, there's still a lot of problems to solve, and I really admire Navarro for finding, like, the best moves here, like a few of them with just seconds on his clock. After king b6, this bishop is out of squares, and... Uh, is the C pawn is ready to queen. What should black play here? Okay, so bishop C8 has been suggested. That is absolutely correct. Yep. Uh, white, black cannot stop this pawn from queening, but what he can do is drag the rook away so that uh, he can queen his own pawn. Now, I believe Kasparov missed the chance for an advantage with knight c6 check here, but it wasn't that great. Instead, he played rook takes c8, thinking he had a forced win after h1 queen. So the game continues now. Rook e8 check, takes c8 queen check, king e7. Yeah, if rook d8 instead, and then e takes f7. After yes. This is also detail. e takes f7 wins the, wins the rook. Yes. And white is completely winning. After king e7, we can take the rook anyway, yeah. and it's all over. So here, white would be winning, but instead, black played king e7. And it looks like mate, but actually there's uh, a lot of resources for black. And in fact, white has nothing better than a draw by perpetual check here after something like... I think it's queen c7, and then he's yes. got to find the right squares to give a check It's, it's not too hard, I think. Queen c8 yeah, check, yeah. and the black king doesn't have too many places to go. For instance, if king e5, you can give a check on... Yeah, black level loses already. And if rook d7, queen e8. Mm -hmm. And rook e7, queen back to c8, and it should be a perpetual pretty easily. Yeah. King e5, there's knight c6, and here it actually works. So, <laughs> Although it's close, but it works. <laughs> it's not that close that time. In any case, so uh, Kasparov thought he had a win here, and I, I was watching this live, and he was like very confident with the move, but uh, he was quick to get a cold shower. So he played knight c6 check. And now the black king has only one square, d6, and after queen d7, it's mate. Culminating off to end a beautiful game. But what did Kasparov miss in this position? It looks like someone has already called it. But yes, queen c6 is played. And somebody asks, is this luck for Navarro? That's a very good question. I'm going to say no. Yeah, I agree. This was, uh, there was very low time on the clock. A good player makes their own chances, and a good player gets lucky. Good players save lost positions. Um, what Navarro did was he made Kasparov's life as difficult as possible when he had a completely lost position. He managed to let Gary lose control of the game and get to a position that required extremely accurate play with less than a minute on the clock. And even for Kasparov, this is out of this was this proved to be too much. Yeah, I mean, one of my coaches told me once that, you know, it's almost karma that when you miss a lot of wins and the the path gets narrow and narrower and narrower, then these resources begin to appear. So Kasparov made the job more and more difficult. He made more and more inaccuracies, and I think it's only fitting that once you get into such a complicated position, the chances for some sort of a tactical shot become a lot higher than they once were when the bishop, for example, was just buried on g6. In addition, starting with bishop e4 in a very complicated position with basically no time, Navarro played perfectly. Yeah, so he, he earned deserves, it almost. Yeah. Yeah. Now the point here after queen c6 is no matter how white recaptures the queen, he's going to lose. If king takes c6, his queen is lost like so. And then f3 comes. And mm. black is queening. 
and if Queen C6, as was played, Rook D6, Kasparov resigned here because after the inevitable pawn ending, after something like takes takes, White can include you takes F7 if he wants, but after King E7, this pawn is going nowhere. At the end of the day, this F4 pawn is going to Queen, and White is too slow. He's one tempo too slow to bring the king back, and he's also one tempo too slow to bring his own pawn forward. So it's really a tragic game for Kasparov. And I think this really was a lot of what his turn was about. He lost a lot of really good positions. Uh, I remember another one in the end with Aronian where he got a really nice position. Oh, yeah, the Enzo game. game. Yeah. But, you know, we, we've been ragging on him a bit, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to show some of his Class C games too mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, on the last day in particular, he really turned things around. So let's close this. Uh, you all will see our ugly faces for a moment mm -hmm. again, I think. Uh, and now uh, we'll find some of the uh the blitz games better games from kasparov so um where was uh, this game with carolina i right, lost here and then yeah he beat maybe yeah, carolina he beat a couple of guys with black which was impressive carolina dominguez yeah this one i didn't love this much let's check for that i liked the nakamura game a lot actually uh -huh. yeah yeah this was when this is a nice positional game so um <laughs> learning our lesson yeah so hopefully <laughs> no one is cheating this way all right so we're going to check the next one here i need to share the screen and yeah, um, now now you're seeing early faces yeah okay so share all right so hopefully you all can see it now um and uh okay so uh here we're having kasparov play white against nakamura his former pupil, actually, <laughs> yeah. uh, back a long time ago. I think they had something of a falling out while they were working together. But as far as I know, now they're on good terms. And mm -hmm. uh, they've played a lot of uh, really interesting games. So uh, Kasparov played the Queen C2 Nimzo, which he was playing the entire time this turn with very limited success, I think. But uh, It's quite hard to explain this choice. I mean, there's several other lines that are lower maintenance, I think. Yes. And maybe give more concrete chances in Blitz. Right. Well, that's definitely true. Um, but I think Kasparov was never one to shy away from high maintenance things. He was always playing King's Indian yeah. and Knight, or if it's just the way he operates. Uh, but after Knight F3, DC4, Queen C4, B6, this is sort of the main line of the Nimzo with Queen C2. And most games are just sort of ending in a draw. But Kasparov plays H4. He's, he played <laughs> this more than once, this event. And I really struggled to understand the point of this at all. But then I think this game sort of showed it. Now, I don't really believe in h4, but we'll sort of see what happens. So c5 from Hikaru is the most principled response. I think it's a mistake, but it's the most principled move. Yeah, he's striking in the center when Kaspar is moving on the flank. Yeah, white's mm -hmm. underdeveloped and all that. So after dc, bc, you know, white has, black has a worse pawn structure, but he's way ahead in development. And here, h5. Now, this is the point of the move, is to keep throwing this pawn and abandoning all principles. The problem for black is if white is allowed to play the move h6, for example, let's say black continues to develop as if nothing happened. After h6, if he wants to, I mean, if white gets hg7, and first of all, black is going to get made in. But secondly, his pieces suddenly make sense. It doesn't matter that his bishop is in f1 because his rook is plenty active, and his bishop can stay on f1 and be totally fine after g3 or e3. Um, but if black plays g6, which is sort of the typical move in response, after bishop g5, he's in a really annoying pin here. Yeah. And, and then the huge weaknesses, I mean, in g7 square is still, you can't forget about that, especially if it puts a kind of queen on c3. Like, knight bd7, queen c3 looks reasonable. Yes. And this now it's now it's like a dead pin. I might even cast a long here. Oh, I mean, God, yeah, and rook this, d7 just wins, yeah. This, so this really seems like the end of the world. So, obviously, Hikaru didn't want to do that, and he played h6 um, to stop this. But here, Kasparov showed what he had in mind. So I'd like everyone to see if they can figure out what is the Kasparov move in this position. Who all can find the Kasparov move? While we're waiting for it, I'm just going to say once again that this is Sam Shanklin and Daniel Naroditsky, a couple total potsers from California. <laughs> yep. We're with iChess, and we uh, we both have series that are now on uh, on sale. The two series combined, that's over 30 hours of instruction. I'll just put the link in the description below while we're waiting. Looks like some people have found some moves. Yeah, right as we're announcing it, which is a sign that, you know, of course, you need to get the series. Yeah, so, you know, it's all, it's all that stuff. So, indeed, white plays g4. And it's funny, but I think this is largely the strategic move. I don't think he really anticipates giving mate. I think white realizes he's not going to avoid a queen exchange and things like that. But by playing g4, 
When he plays g5, he will gain the g5 square for his bishop. He's gained the g2 square for his other bishop. Then his rook can come to h4, and all of his pieces make perfect sense. So Nakamura felt the need to try to trade queens right away, which makes sense because if you give Kasparov time to play g5, yeah, then he's going to get made it. Then you will get made it. Mm -hmm. Here, I think you're not going to because White has to trade queens. But now Black's position becomes very difficult. For instance, if he plays e takes d5 after g5, uh, there's just a lot of problems to solve. Um, yeah, I mean, it's takes, g. I'd take with the bishop, I would say. And after something like knight e4, bishop f4, I just like White's position here. Yeah, and the pawns, they look, they look, you know, they might look intimidating, but they're going to just be attacked, and h6 can be thrown in at any point. Right. Two bishops, uh, this is too much. It's funny because you might think Black is ahead in development, but I actually don't think so because the rook on h1 is sort of developed. White is ready for like rook c1, bishop g2, developing two pieces the same way Black might play bishop e6, knight c6. And the white king on e1 is totally fine. doesn't have to castle. So here I, I think white is just better. Um, instead, I believe Hikaru took with the knight. He did. And still g5. Takes, takes. And now development is actually pretty close to equal when you consider that white is not going to have to castle. He's totally happy to leave his king on e1. He'll develop with bishop g2, rook c1, and stuff like that. And his other rook can lift via h4 into the game. And here, uh, with development equal and white holding a healthy bishop here and black's pawn structure being dubious, I think Kasparov has really punished Nakamura here. And this was the only game I really saw where I thought h4 kind of worked. I know Kasparov has been trying h4 a bit, but uh, this one, he really got what he wanted. So f6, the bishop simply drops back. Knight c6, rook c1 going after the weak pawn, which cannot be defended. Black tried knight d4 looking for counterplay, but there's not really that much to find. Yeah, I mean, and that Kasparov doesn't buy it, and the fact that the pawn structure is going to be crippled is not pertinent here at all. I mean, a pawn's a pawn, and right. the king's side happenings are going to be a lot more meaningful than yeah. these pawns. And the, the king's side pawns here, even a pure pawn endgame, we're seeing that the double pawns don't hinder white because they hold black box pawn majority mm. totally fine. Well, white has the healthy two on one on the queen side. In addition, white has a healthy bishop pair on what's becoming an increasingly open board. Uh, so Kasparov uh, won this game. Hikaru actually was reasonably resourceful in the defense, just like he was in previous games, but uh, this time it wasn't quite enough. So rook h4 is another move I like. I've been calling for this move a lot, and it finally happened. Uh, the rook is ready to activate via the center. It's funny, you might say the bishop on f1 is undeveloped, but I would argue that bishop is totally fine on f1. I think it's performing a totally active role. In this. Yeah, I mean, you don't always have to. Again, the threat is stronger than this execution. Maybe it'll go to h3, maybe c4, but... Right now, it's you know it's very comfortable. I mean, it's right. controlling a lot of squares as is. So rook fb8, hoping for some queenside counterplay. But after b4, this pawn is incredibly solid. Black tried to secure the b5 square for his bishop, but Kasparov simply did not care. He centralized yeah, his pieces. this is really always. nice. Bishop b5, bishop g2. No, thank you. <laughs> does not want to trade. He'll keep the bishop here, and white is ready to play f4 and follow it up with f5. So rook e8, f4. I mean, Black, this is forced, otherwise he's yeah. going to play f5. If and... White plays f5 himself, then the, the position is totally beyond saving. And so bishop f3, just a simple move, keeping everything nice and protected. I mean, it's if you look at how harmoniously White coordinates here, all of his pawns are protected, all of his pieces are protected. There's nothing loose at all. He's got two bishops, an extra pawn. This was really the culmination of Kasparov's success. And in particular, I like that he did it in sort of the fashion that I'm talking about in my series, using tactical concrete play to advance positional goals. He's playing aggressive thrusts like h4, h4, h5, g4, g5, stuff like this. At the end of the day, you know, he's getting his pieces to good squares and then that one him a pawn. And so it was, uh, I really liked the way he played here. And I think it sort of fits in with the Shanklin method. Uh, unfortunately, this game happened after I recorded the series, so I couldn't use it as instructional material. But rest no, assured, we're using it now. <laughs> rest assured, some of Kasparov's games definitely made it in there. Uh, question here, Rook 65. Um, That's a good question. Why is well, that bad? There's two, there's two reasons. One is a concrete reason. Um, Black would recapture on d5 with check, which would render, you know, I, I'm sure that you intended to, to recapture on d5 with the bishop and then take the rook back, winning a pawn. But even if White's king were on d1, I would argue that Rook 65 would be cashing in way too soon because it leads to an opposite color bishop position after, like, Rook 65. If you can, you can play, like, yeah, king sure. d1... Uh, Okay, so or, say king d1. And then king yeah. g8 or something, yeah. And rook takes d5. Yeah, either one. I, of course, the endgame should still be winning. Pawn takes, bishop takes, yeah. king In this big. particular case, because f5 is hanging. Yeah, but um, even still, I would say that, you yeah. know... I mean, in the game, I think Kasparov did take on d5, but he yeah. took with the bishop, and I think that's important because ultimately white's going to end up with two pawns up, but one of them is not great on the king side. 
And opposite color bishops always give drawing chances. But you should be careful. I mean, the point is you should always be careful when transitioning to yeah. opposite color bishop endgames, even if you're winning several pawns in the process, especially when there are no rooks on the board. And if you're on the attacking side, you want to keep rooks on. So, for example, even if you take d5 was not a check, it'd probably be better to take on d5 with the bishop yeah. and leave all the rooks on. Because then there'd be chances on the king side. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I uh, I like the way Kasparov played, though. He played bishop c3. He certainly is not worried about knight takes c3. In this particular case, it fails directly to bishop takes a8. But even without that, I think uh, white is very happy to trade off his dark squared bishop for a knight. And mm -hmm. if you look at all of black's pawns saddled on white squares and weaknesses, and all of white's on dark squares. And in addition, this clears the d2 square for the king. So rook e7, king d2. And uh, finally here, Kasparov goes for it. But this is also a very different case than what we saw previously, because at the end of all this, the f5 pawn, I think, is simply... Yeah, it's a crucial detail. Yeah. If black were able to hold on to f5 here, I think he'd have a very decent position. Or not decent position, but chances to save the game for sure. In fact, he can hold f5 here, but he has to put his pieces in very passive squares mm -hmm. to do so. He could play bishop d7 or rook f7. He tried rook d7, which is good. I mean, it seems natural to trade rooks, but unfortunately he's simply too slow because his king is way yeah. too far away from the queen side. So, yeah, I mean, I said you need to be careful when you transition. Kasparov was careful, and he yes. understood that the fact that he's going to make a pass around the queen side is going to outweigh you know tendencies of this yeah. end game. For instance, if I think I believe this position would probably be a draw if the g7 pawn and h5 pawn were exchanged immediately, mm -hmm. but it's going to take black some effort to accomplish that. So when white simply starts running up with his king, black cannot follow suit and start running with his king in response after something like this and try to come to the defense <laughs> because go very far. <laughs> g7 is going to be hanging. So um, Kasparov tri or Nakamura tried g6, but. Uh, after h6, which is a very strong move. Yeah. Uh, because if white plays h takes g6, takes uh, this extra pawn white has on the king side is totally meaningless, but it's not meaningless that black can bring his king back faster. Following h6 Really, takes, really nice move. Here, yeah. not only is black one tempo slower because he doesn't have g6, but he's actually a lot slower because he can't come to g7. He's got to go all the way h7, g8, all the way around like that. And the extra pawn he has on g6 is of no significance. In both cases, um, there's... Uh, there's no chance for either side to make a pass pawn. So king d4, and now someone has suggested king g7 may have drawn here. It might, but I doubt it. Uh, instead, after this, uh, white simply ran in. Bishop d2 is a very classy move. You don't want to play bishop e5, because then after king f3, you lose one of the pawns. Yeah, and you certainly don't want to give up a pawn, because that leads right. to huge complications. And after king f3, king b6. Yeah. So you keep the important pawn. There, and four. a4 takes, or sorry, you'll also notice that this bishop on d2 is on the right diagonal. For instance, after takes here, yes, white did lose a pawn. But if white's bishop were on e5, black would have a very simple drawing mechanism of playing, of taking the pawn on b5, playing king f3, king g4, and getting g5 in. Given that um, uh, the bishop is on d2, that won't work. So for instance, uh, king c6 is played, king e2 doesn't really matter. But let's say black were to take on b5 here, here, here. The whole point is that the bishop on d2, in addition to protecting the pawn on f4, is also controlling the g5 square. So after g5, fg, black cannot take this pawn, it is defended, and tier white is just winning. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there, again, there wasn't that much left in the game. Black tried king e2, but after bishop c1 and bishop a3. Yeah, bishop just chills around here, and then when the, if, if ever the king returns to f3, the bishop returns to c1. Right. So black loses a few tempi every time. That's just a little, yeah. Bishop e3 didn't work. Someone asks, well, black will bring the king back to e2 and harass this bishop some more. The whole point is white is going to have to leave this all important c1 f4 diagonal, but before doing so, he wants to drag the king as far away from yeah. there as possible. So it makes sense to bring the king all the way to d1, only now put the bishop away. And then, uh, in fact, he, here he, he played he bishop just, e7. I'm sure b b6 probably just Yeah, wins, it's, it's but... not necessary. After b6, white is still winning because if black plays king here after bishop c1 check, uh, well, in fact, here the king actually doesn't even have a good square. But uh, after something like king d4 or king f2, whatever you want to call it, g6 or b7. And it's over, yeah. Again, the white bishop is far enough away. So this, I think, was Kasparov's best game. I and mean, he really came together on the last day. I'm almost sad it ended on day five. Mm -hmm. I think that if there was another day, he might have shown some more good play. Yeah, I mean, I think if he plays a classical tournament, he, he wouldn't collapse, you know, because no. he'd have more time to think. Um, I'd be I'd pay money to see that, actually. I would really like to see him play in a classical tournament. Yeah, I definitely noticed he had a really bad game as well um, after that loss to Novara. I think mm. he, he needed some time to recover and... Just didn't have it. Oh, he so. lost to Lim or some some. No, no, like he that. beat Liam, but then he lost. Uh, oh, that was the rapid segment where he. Yeah, yeah he lost. 
with white again i think somehow i don't remember yeah. exactly but uh in any case there's just, just a couple more minutes i think we should pay at least a little attention to the tournament winner with one game mm -hmm. before uh, we call it quits so sure. we'll show one game from levon aronian before uh calling it quits on this webinar so um what was your favorite aronian game of this group um i was mostly following kasparov let me of course. if i remember any Aronian Kasparov wasn't anything to write home about. Gary was just much better. Uh, Aronian interesting game against Navarra, I think. We featured Navarra a lot. Um, there's that crazy game with a bunch of sacks. Um, I don't think it was very sound, but. Um, well, uh, was this in the Rapid or in the Blitz? Oh, uh, God. I think it might have been might have been the Rapid. Who was what? It was Aronian was white and Navarra was black. All right, so. so yeah. Okay, so, um, all right, yeah, yeah, we'll take this was a brilliant game. Yeah. All right, so we're going to uh, go back to this one. Stop here. We're going to get Aronia and Navarra, and this will be the last game we're going to cover before calling it quits and begging you once again to buy our yes. series. So uh, the opening of this game I don't think was wildly interesting. I just want to make sure everyone can see this. Um, we can see. Okay, so um, it started out as a Queens Indian, and I don't want to talk too much about the opening. This is a reasonably topical line nowadays. Um, I don't think Quincy two is especially normal, but I guess Aronian was had, had it prepared. TC BC Rook AD one Quincy eight, and here White had a chance to really change the character of the position, uh, which he which he chose to take by playing the move E four, and now Black definitely doesn't want to take this pawn because it leaves him with a really lousy structure. So. He tried bishop f8, and now after f4, d4, black is really pushing this pawn forward. And if white plays a simple move with a knight, I think he's not going to be too happy. Yeah, and something simple like knight, knight somewhere, maybe so. Knight c6 should be fine for black. So, yeah. Um, uh, but Aronian showed his idea with knight d5. And after takes, takes f6, it seems like he's just falling flat on his face. After knight c6, uh, knight takes, he's simply losing a pawn. If knight c4, mm. queen d7, he's also losing a pawn. It just seems like everything is not really working. But here we see his idea, is that Iranian is willing to give up a piece with this move, rook dd e1, which I think was absolutely ingenious, because uh, it's sort of long-term compensation, sort of short-term compensation. But uh, after takes, takes... These pawns are just huge, obviously. Right. Um, and black is a bit underdeveloped, and he has to worry about some sacrifices. Yeah, and it's rapid, so a very savvy decision over the board, right. especially. Now, if white can play e6 and really shut down that black net mb8, uh, then white will be ready for moves like rook f7 and try to give mate. So it makes a lot of sense for black to play knight d7, developing his knight, and uh, putting pressure on the e5 pawn. So e6, knight f6. And it seems like, well, you know, yeah, white's got these two connected passers, but they're sort of starting to come under pressure. But... Iranian came up with a very nice idea here, so I'd like to see if anyone can figure out what what should play in this position. Someone pointing out Kasparov was always a GM. That is not true. He got his GM when he was sixteen. Yeah, he was when he was born. He was, I think, a small baby. Just like yeah. the rest of them. He just knew. No, Kasparov was the man. So who can find Iranian's move here? I think it's a move Kasparov would like to play. Yeah. Yep, rook f6 indeed. More fuel on the fire. After mm -hmm. g takes f6, white is down a rook, but this rook on a8 is not participating in the defense. And it might seem like white only has one pawn, but really pawns on like c5, a7, they just don't do anything. Yeah. The, the value pawns are in the center for white here. It's very sound. I mean, it's very even positionally sound. I think a lot of people sometimes are like, oh, you know, I would never do that. But really, it's very understandable. I mean, look at these monster pawns. Look at all the pieces in the attack. Right. It's, it's a very objectively sound attack. So after queen d8, white now has a very important move to keep his attack roaring ahead. Let's see if anyone can find it. I probably should hide it, right? Yeah, or you can go and do training. Yeah. All right, let's see if anyone can find this brilliant move. Malhar Singh has found the last one. Let's see if he can find the next one, too. Or is correct. This is a very important move because bishop e4 looks very natural. Um, so put more pressure on this h7 pawn and play from it. But unfortunately, once black defends against the simple threat with like queen c7 or rook e7, the problem is white doesn't have a great way to bring his rook into the game. 
Uh, it's better to first bring the rook into the game, and one, then once the rook is on a great square like yeah. g4 or h4, then bring the bishop. You want to be cautious about making these tempting moves, when you're, especially when you're down material, because this attack is fragile. You can't just throw some right. moves out there. And it's important to notice with rook e4 that the pawn on d5 is not hanging. If something like bishop takes d5, rook g4 check in between move, and then after bishop takes d5, white will take back a piece and just be completely winning. So here, I believe the computer said that h5 is the only holding move here, mm -hmm. but I wow. mean... Good luck finding that in a rapid game. I don't think I would find it. I mean, it looks insane among other things, allowing queen takes h5. Yeah, what's... <laughs> I don't even... I'm not sure I get the point. I think rook e7 was the move here or something mm -hmm. like that, but I don't really remember so well. Um, in any case, black tried rook e7 directly, but this didn't really work because after rook g4 check, white's attack is simply crashing through. Black would love to play rook g7, but uh, he can't because after bishop e4... The pawn on h7 is simply going to collapse and with it the game. Yeah, that's so black weird. was reduced to playing king h8. And now after just simple move, bishop e4, it's black can hardly even move here. I mean, you want to try to trade off this rook, but rook g7, I will have rook takes g7 followed by queen h7 mate. Bishop g7, I have queen yeah, h7. I can't put g7 is the key square, and if you can't and, put anything there, then... And white is ready for queen takes f6 in the not-so-distant future, and it can't be defended against, and the position fell apart very quickly for black. So rook c8, I guess, makes some sense. I mean, maybe rook c7 is a thought to overprotect the seventh rank, or maybe you could even dream of c4 for counterplay. But after rook h4, uh, there's not too much more to discuss. So the pawn on h7 is now hit hard again. If black plays rook c7, I believe queen takes f6 mm -hmm. is the end of the world. Because you cannot... even bishop h7 after king g8. Yeah. If all else fails. Right, and if bishop g7, we have rook h7 and rook g7. And, and this is a massacre, lost. yeah. And it's mate. So... Um, <laughs> So yeah, black tried king g8, but this doesn't help very much. Rook takes h7, and now white is threatening queen g6. Black tried bishop d5, but uh, here white has a very nice mate in three. I'd like to see if anyone can find it. We'll call it quits after this one if you can do that. So uh, who all can find mate in three here? Get it all the way out to checkmate. If you do that, I will give you an amazing prize, a link to a discount <laughs> for the Naroditsky Shanklin method. For only $79, you get the two of them. If you can find the mate here in three, I will give you that link. It's an amazing prize that you definitely want. <laughs> Who all can find mate in three? Sam is so nice, he types in the link anyway. I am assuming someone <laughs> will find it. Yeah. All quiet on the Western Front. There we go. Queen G6. No, that doesn't work. People are all <laughs> wrong. Come on, people get with the program. That's not working. Queen G6. If Rook G7, Queen F7 will not work because this is not mate. <laughs> Resign, Let's not do man. that. But after rook g7, white can play rook takes g7 check, queen f7, and this will be made pretty easily, I think. I'm not sure. Well, yeah, I mean, king h8, queen h5, and bishop oh, d5. Bishop oh, bishop h6. Queen g8. Actually, yeah, I've managed to make this harder than it needs to be. Queen h5 or not. Queen h5, bishop b4. If I go takes, takes, check, bishop d5, and I'm completely winning. Yeah. Um, there's got to be an easier mate. Maybe bishop h6 first. Yeah, this is the way, right? Bishop h6, yeah, and then queen h7 to queen h8 as an idea. Yeah, so this should just be made very easily. Um, in the game, though, uh, in the game, queen h5 was played, which is even yeah. stronger. Uh, the whole point was bishop g7, there's mate here. Um, after rook g7, queen h5, this is also just mate. I think rook g7 also worked, but queen h5 and after bishop e4. Uh, Navarra nicely mate. allowed. Yeah, the yeah Navarra always a gentleman allowed the checkmate on the board. Uh, so it was a really beautiful game from Iranian. I guess it was Daniel's favorite of his many victories in this tournament. Yeah. I really liked it as well. Um, in any case, I think that'll call it be enough for our webinar. Um, this is uh, so. This is just one last time. I'm going to spam you guys with. Uh, yeah, we can here. do our faces again. I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're sorry about that. So, um, you know. Uh, yeah, I know you. Let's see, you can see us now? Yeah. Yeah, so we're selling our course. Uh, it's $79, $79 for two separate series, each of them 15 hours, one by him, one by me. They're really good. If you watch them, you take them seriously, you do the uh, training, they yeah, get improve. much better at chess. If you don't buy them... Yeah, we're, we're watching. We know who you are. Yeah. So, uh, so definitely, it's an investment, but... Thanks much for watching, everyone. Thank you. Tomorrow. 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 Tomorr
All right, we're going to have the webinar tomorrow, same so uh, same time. So be yeah. back then, and we will uh, spam you some more about our series then. And if you buy it in the meantime, please come back anyway and tell everyone how great it was. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank uh, we'll you. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.